watching today. I am Professor Vinny Naidu, Dean of the Faculty of Veterinary Science and your host for the evening. It gives me great pleasure to welcome you to the inaugural address of Professor Lindy McGaw from our Department of Paraclinical Sciences. Also, a special warm welcome to Professor Temba Musia, our Vice Principal of Student Life, who will be officiating over today's function. Today we gather to listen to Lindy's inaugural address as she starts on a new journey as a full professor at the University of Pretoria and the Faculty of Veterinary Science. Today, we'll hear how she plans to further develop her field of study being ethnopharmacology and ethnoveterinary medicine. To start tonight's proceeding, I would like to invite Professor Musia to do a formal introduction of Professor Mago. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to this special occasion. I hope you'll enjoy this evening with us as Professor Mago shares her exciting academic journey. On behalf of the Senate of the University of Pretoria, I'd like to make use of this opportunity to extend a special word of welcome to Professor Lindy McGaw herself, to members of her family and friends who are attending this session. They have indeed provided valuable support to her throughout her career. And colleagues in the Department of Phytomedicine and further afield, we have taken this time to share in this auspicious occasion as well. My colleagues in the executive, the Dean of the Faculty of Veterinary Science, Professor Viri Nairu, and his Deputy Deans, Professor Marino Westhazen and Professor Dietmar Hope, and other members of the senior management of the university. And of course, our bright and wonderful students. There are a few auspicious events in the life of an academic and graduation is probably the first. And then the occasion at which one's doctoral degree is conferred is most certainly among the top ranked memorable events. And then is the inaugural address. It is a distinctive university tradition that provides a particular opportunity to celebrate the exciting academic endeavors we go through. And for those involved in academia, just to sit back a little and listen to one of the esteemed colleagues with undivided attention. And for those who are outside any of these disciplinary fields, like family and friends, to have a peek you know, and witness the journey and hard labor of a candidate. And it is also an opportunity for the speaker to share with the world what excites her the most. After reading a curriculum vitae and abstract, and I recently met Professor McGall to get a better sense of the person behind a really impressive paper. She was born in Zimbabwe and moved to South Africa with her family when she was eight. She completed her schooling in Johannesburg and with both parents being teachers, it was almost inevitable that uh, she would become an intellectual. Thus, Professor Mago, as we know her, began her scientific career studying genetics and molecular biology at the University of Natal in Peter Marsberg, now known as UKZN. After completing her honors degree, she entertained her wanderlust and spent some time living and working in London, traveled and backpacking through Europe, expanding her horizons and her already open-minded thinking. In 1998, she returned to Peter Marisbeck for an MSc in Botany with a scientific focus 
on the medicinal uses of plants in the Amazon nation and tradition. The 19th century German physician and medical historian, Johann Hermann Bars, describes botany as the eldest daughter of medicine. An up description, if you consider that uh, Prof. Magor's research interests entailed exploring the biological activity and toxicity of plants with potential health applications in both humans and animals. Her research interests for a master's degree was of such a high quality that the degree was upgraded to a PhD. And in academic terms, this is an exceptional achievement. And Prof. Magor began her association with the University of Pretoria in 2002, when she joined the research group of her predecessor, Professor Corbus Yelov, as a postdoctoral fellow. And more fellowships and positions at King's College London, the University of Adelaide, and the University of Cosmonatal followed. In the meantime, Professor Magor also completed her law degree through the University of South Africa in 2007 and married her zoologist fiance, who progressed to become her veterinarian husband. And in 2015, she rejoined the University of Pretoria as associate professor and leader of the phytomedicine program studying the use of plants and herbs for the purpose of cure and mitigation of human and or animal ailments in the Department of Paraclinical Sciences. Being a prominent, being a prominent researcher, Prof. Magor serves on editorial boards of several national and international scientific journals. She's an alumnus of the South African Young Academy of Science. She leads a large research group of postdoctoral fellows, PhD and MSc students, and has already supervised 25 PhDs and 11 MSCs to completion. And she has published 21 book chapters and more than 150 research articles in peer-reviewed scientific journals. She has presented results of her research at numerous national and international conferences and has delivered a series of guest lectures at the University of Bologna in Italy. And many of you know that the University of Bologna is one of the oldest universities in the world. In 2013, she was listed as one of the top 31 cited African researchers in pharmacology and toxicology by Thomas Reuters. And she was awarded the Young Researcher of the Year in 2009 and, and Researcher of the Year 2018 at the Faculty of Veterinary Science and is a leader of the Faculty Research Team on Translational Medicine. But that's not all. Together with a senior research fellow, Prof. McGaw, recently edited a book on ethno-veterinary medicine, the traditional use of plants in animal health. And she currently she's currently a co-convener of the Plant Sciences Ratings Panel of the National Research Foundation. Lectures ethno-veterinary medicine to undergraduate veterinary students, veterinary law and ethics, and also moderate jurisprudence exams for the South African Veterinary Council. She's a member of several scientific societies, on occasion serving as a council member. Among Prof. McCall's current research interests are the antimicro antimicrobial anti-parasitic, anti-inflammatory, and cytotoxic effects of plant extracts and purified compounds isolated from plants. 
She's also interested in, in immune modularity activity of plant preparations and mechanisms of action studies in bioactive plant compounds. The research emphasis of the phytomedicine program ultimately targets the development of effective and safe antiparasitic antimicrobial remedies for use in animals and human medicine. And of course, alternatives to antimicrobial feed additives and supplements in production animals and poultry. I'm sure you will agree with me, ladies and gentlemen, that this is more than a mouthful. But she's not only an astute and hardworking academic with a bright and promising future ahead of her. Apart from her professional achievements, she manages to live a personal life too. Kind and caring, she treasures her very close-knit family and two children who shed love of plants and animals has already manifested in the managery of uh, household pets. Now, ladies and gentlemen, I present to you our esteemed colleague, Professor Lindy McGall. Thank you. Professor Musia, Professor Naidu, colleagues, family and friends, good evening and thank you for the opportunity to present this address. As was mentioned in the kind introduction, I'm going to be discussing ethno-veterinary medicine as a link between the past and future, mainly in terms of animal health care, but with an underlying One Health theme. Our research group is located at the University of Pretoria in the northeast of the country. It houses the only veterinary faculty in the country and is one of the leading research intensive universities. Based at the Faculty of Veterinary Science, which is some distance north of the Pretoria city centre, one of the major research areas of the phytomedicine program is ethno-veterinary medicine. We're fortunate to be in a position to collaborate with many veterinary and other colleagues on projects of mutual interest. The veterinary faculty boasts state-of-the-art facilities for student training, as well as world-class research laboratories, and we have established links with many leading international institutions. The phytomedicine program has been based at the Faculty of Veterinary Science since 2002. It was founded in 1995 by Professor Kurbus Ierloff and was initially hosted at the Department of Pharmacology at the Prinzhof or medical campus. Prof Eloff is currently affiliated with the program still in an extraordinary lectureship position and together with my permanent appointment we have a permanent laboratory technologist, Mrs. Sana Nkarimeng. She has just recently finished her PhD project and is hoping for a good result soon. There is an active research program in our group with around 100 MSc and PhD students graduating in the past 20 or so years. Currently, we have 15 MSc and PhD students and two postdoctoral fellows. To give an outline of the presentation, I will first cover the use of plants as medicinal agents. Then, definitions of ethno-veterinary medicine and its relation to One Health will be dealt with. The historical use of plants in human and animal health is an aspect of the past referred to in the title. The current crisis of antimicrobial and antiparasitic drug resistance will be mentioned in terms of the potential contribution that can be supplied by investigating further the medications largely based on plants that were historically the medicine chests of our ancestors. I will finally go on to discuss some of the past and present projects which are moving on to the future involving several postgraduate students to highlight some of our focus areas with a view to contributing solutions for the future. I would like to introduce some concepts here that are important for my area of research in ethno-veterinary medicine. Plants have been used as medicines for millennia. The first commercial pure natural product introduced for therapeutic use was morphine marketed by Merck in 1826. The first semi-synthetic pure drug, aspirin, was based on a natural product, salicin, isolated from the willow tree, Salix alba, introduced by Bayer in 1899. 
There are many other plant-derived medicinal compounds used currently both in human and in animal medicine. Some of the third-year veterinary students in the VME 310 module on ethno-veterinary medicine are quite surprised to see how many current veterinary drugs were originally derived from plants. Plants were a major component of veterinary pharmacopoeia until at least the 1960s. Natural products or secondary metabolites are produced by bacteria and fungi as well as plants. Up to 50% of approved drugs during the last 30 years originated directly or indirectly from natural products and higher plants contribute about 25% to this total. In terms of cancers, one example, from the 1940s to date, of 175 small molecules used, 85 are natural products or direct derivatives. Only 35,000 to 70,000 of plant species globally, of a total of around 250,000, have been investigated for their potential medicinal use. And even in these cases, maybe only one or two uses or pharmacological activities have been investigated. In 2015, the Nobel Prize for Physiology and Medicine was jointly awarded for two discoveries. The first half of the prize was awarded for the discovery of avermectin from a microorganism growing in a handful of Japanese soil. Avermectin was then chemically modified to increase its activity and safety, resulting in development of the animal antiparasitic drug ivermectin. The second half of the prize was given to UU2 for discovering artemisinin, the antimalarial, from a Chinese medicinal plant, Artemisia annua, which is traditionally used to prepare a tea to treat fever. South Africa is blessed with amazing plant diversity. There are about 24 to 30,000 plant species, 10% of the world's diversity on only 1% of the global land surface area. Coupled with the incredible plant diversity is the diverse cultural heritage, as well as the rich traditions present in South Africa, including the continuing use of plants for medicinal and other purposes. In South Africa, about 3,000 plants are used in traditional medicine with 350 species most commonly used or traded. Traditional health practitioners, or THPs, and rural livestock keepers have essential roles in primary healthcare for humans and animals respectively, owing to the acute shortage of Western trained doctors or veterinarians, health clinics, and rural veterinary clinics. Then the needs of animals are superimposed on those of humans and the environment, drawing together the concept of one health. Giving impetus to continued research on plants is the emergence of many commercially available products based on useful South African plants. This is also true for the area of animal health, more specifically for companion animal health. To return to the title of the presentation, we need to have a good understanding of what is involved when we talk about ethno-veterinary medicine, or EVM. Essentially, EVM is a complex system of beliefs skills, knowledge and practices relating to general animal husbandry and animal care. The concept was more fully defined by Constance McCorkle, the renowned veterinary anthropologist. EVM includes the use of diagnostic procedures, animal husbandry practices, surgical methods and use of ethno-veterinary plants to prevent and control disease. It most likely dates back to the domestication of animals. Together with the proliferation of scientific articles in recent years, some books have been published in the field. And the one on the left-hand side was edited by South African colleagues in 2010, and members of our group made some contributions in the form of chapters to this book. One book published last year was edited by myself and a senior postdoctoral fellow, Dr. Muna Ali Abdallah, who is the driving force behind this. At the annual meeting of the Society for Medicinal Plant and Natural Product Research, a day-long pre-conference symposium is held by the Networking Group on Medicinal Plants and Natural Products in Animal Healthcare and Veterinary Medicine. And this symposium is increasingly well supported. Ethno-veterinary medicine is commonly used by rural livestock keepers in areas where access to orthodox remedies is limited. Diseases have a significant economic impact on livestock, 
not only in terms of loss of animals, but also loss of transport, farming aids, and decreased output of products such as milk and meat. Cattle, goats, and sheep may suffer from non-specific indications like diarrhea, coughs, and wounds. And it is for these conditions that EVM could be promoted more widely as a possible alternative or complement to Western medicine once more research has been done. It should be kept in mind that ethno-veterinary medicine involves a complex system of management, not only the use of plants in animal health. The plants are used to treat livestock as well as poultry and sometimes companion animals. The owners of these livestock generally treat animals with their own medicinal plant knowledge rather than consulting traditional healers as they would for their own ailments and conditions. But now to get back to the title and main focus of this talk. So before the introduction of synthetic pharmaceuticals, plants were predominantly used to prevent and treat illnesses in animals and in humans. Many of the pathogens associated with epidemics of human disease have evolved into multi-drug resistant or MDR forms subsequent to antibiotic use. Additionally, resistance is also developing in parasites of economic importance, such as the barber pole worm or Haemonchus contortus, affecting small ruminants, particularly sheep. The most prevalent gram-negative pathogens, such as Escherichia coli or E. coli, Salmonella enterica, Pseudomonas aeruginosa, and Klebsiella pneumoniae cause a variety of diseases in humans and animals. A strong correlation between antibiotic use in the treatment of these diseases and antibiotic resistance development has been observed over the past half century. The use of antibiotics at subtherapeutic concentrations in animal production has also contributed significantly to the development of antimicrobial resistance, leading to bans of such practices in many countries, specifically in the EU and other areas. The term superbugs refers to microbes or microorganisms causing enhanced morbidity and mortality following multiple mutations which allow high levels of resistance to the antibiotic classes specifically recommended for their treatment. Therapeutic options for infections caused by these microbes are reduced. In some cases, super-resistant strains have also acquired increased virulence and enhanced transmissibility. There are many definitions of One Health. The Food and Agriculture Organization, or FAO, describes it as a collaborative, international, cross-sectoral, multidisciplinary mechanism to address threats and reduce risks of detrimental infectious diseases at the animal-human ecosystem interface. Never before has this importance of the One Health approach to fighting disease been more appropriate than in these times. The One Health concept relates to integrated, interdisciplinary collaboration and communication among health professions to improve healthcare for humans, animals, and the environment. Now, this is particularly relevant where we are experiencing increasing incidence, incidences of emerging and re-emerging diseases, 75% of which are zoonotic and may have originated from wildlife. The antimicrobial resistance crisis we find ourselves in has provided impetus for the search for complementary strategies to reduce the burden of infectious disease and a One Health approach to this goal is critical. Although EVM comprises a number of different aspects, in our research group we have a specific focus on plants used in preventing and treating diseases in animals. There is a great lack of knowledge on what plants are being used in scientific circles, and this is complicated by issues of intellectual property rights, although South Africa has stringent laws and regulations to protect this. In literature surveys that we have conducted 10 years apart, it was highlighted that a large amount of work needs to be done to document and protect indigenous knowledge regarding the use of plants in animal health. Documentation of plant use can be done in several ways, but there are recently published me methods available in top journals providing guidance for such endeavors. There are also many ways in which to present the results, to analyze them and make sense of them in broader contexts. The graphic on the left refers to South African provinces 
in which some surveys have been done up until 2008, and the one on the right depicts provinces surveyed up until 2019. It's clear that much work needs to be done in this regard. There are many challenges involved with conducting ethno-veterinary medicine surveys. For example, seasonality is often an issue, as different plants may be used at different times of the year, pending availability. Trust relationships need to be established and not infringed, with clear indications of intentions and benefit sharing agreements should this become relevant, which it is should there be a need for commercialization at a later stage. The need for involvement of a veterinarian or animal health technician is vital to ensure correct interpretation of traditional diagnoses and relating them to clinical symptoms. This slide represents a study that one of our MSc students undertook to survey plants used for animal treatment in the Anisi community of Bushbuck Ridge. Now, the University of Pretoria runs a community veterinary clinic in the area and has a research facility nearby. On the left, one of the dip tanks where the interviews were conducted is shown. Then Tatu is interviewing a livestock keeper with one of the animal health technicians from the clinic to see what plants are being used, how they are involved in the treatment, and how the remedies are prepared and administered. This was followed by evaluation of traditionally prepared plant-based remedies in the lab for antimicrobial efficacy and in vitro toxicity, compared to extracts prepared using typical organic solvents that we'd use in the lab for extraction of plant material. Interestingly, the methods of traditional preparation appeared to result in extracts with enhanced activity compared to the other solvent extracts. An important part of this process is the feedback to the community reflected in the final picture where results of the surveys, results of the laboratory investigations are discussed with the community to try and see where we can go ahead from here. Ethno-veterinary medicine studies provide valuable knowledge supporting the development of innovative products for prevention or treatment of common livestock diseases. Research into developing standardized, low-cost preparations would take care of the issues of seasonal availability, variation in terms of chemical composition of the plants, as well as known efficacy and safety. Only four of nine provinces have been surveyed, and even then, the areas have not been fully covered. Maybe only a few villages in each province have been evaluated and assessed for knowledge that might be present there. There is much to be done to complete the ethno-veterinary medicine inventory of South Africa. The use of certain plant species for similar ailments by different ethnic groups can provide interesting leads for prioritizing research. Continuing on, I would like to discuss some examples of the activities or projects we have been involved with over the past few years. These largely concern in vitro investigations of biological activity and toxicity of plant species with potential for further development. Diarrhea is a condition affecting humans and animals, particularly neonates, with negative economic and other consequences. Escherichia coli or E. coli serotypes are particularly problematic and other species belonging to genera such as Salmonella are also of concern. Many plants are used traditionally against diarrhea and several students in our group have tested plant extracts against model bacterial strains as well as clinical isolates from diarrhea cases. Combination studies of plant extracts, fractions of these extracts and pure compounds together with current antibiotics have shown enhanced antibacterial activity in some cases. Apart from direct antibacterial activity, chemicals found in plants may also affect bacteria in other ways. What we have learned from the antimicrobial and antiparasitic resistance crisis is that resistance to newly introduced compounds develops extremely quickly. We need to embrace a more holistic approach to tackle the problem from different angles simultaneously. Traditional remedies often comprise decoctions or infusions, and we found that although water extracts often don't have direct antibacterial activity, they may have different mechanisms to combat bacterial infections. For example, bacteria are able to secrete quorum sensing molecules to communicate with one another. 
Most infectious diseases are caused by bacteria which multiply within quorum sensing or QS facilitated biofilms. A biofilm usually begins to form when a free-living or planktonic bacterium attaches to a surface, which could be a living or a non-living surface. Quorum sensing chemicals are released to attract other bacteria to form a biofilm, and this consortium of bacteria secrete extracellular polymeric substances, or EPS. This EPS assists in sheltering the bacteria from harmful factors in the environment, such as desiccation, antibiotics, and the host body's immune system. Biofilm or quorum sensing inhibitors are therefore sought after, and several plant extracts have shown promise in this area. In addition, bacteria need to adhere to host cells in sufficient numbers to be able to produce a clinical infection. Anti-adhesion factors from plants could also be useful antibacterial agents. Resistance mechanisms of bacteria include efflux pumps, which function to pump out antibiotics from the bacterial cell, reducing their efficacy. Certain chemicals, including some from plants, are able to inhibit these efflux pumps, reversing the resistance. Using either scanning or transmission electron microscopy, we are able to detect ultrastructural changes or damage induced by plant extracts or compounds on target bacteria. One such study was that of a previous PhD student, currently a postdoctoral fellow in our group. Michael's work resulted in several papers on the efficacy of plant species from the Myrtaceae family on bacteria. Biofilm inhibitory effects were noticeable, and electron microscopy studies highlighted the direct effects of some of the plant extracts and compounds on the ultrastructure of the E. coli isolates implicated in causing diarrhea investigated. Gastrointestinal infectious diseases caused by foodborne pathogens result in enormous health and economic concerns worldwide. Salmonellosis, caused by the genus Salmonella, is one of the most common foodborne diseases in both animals and humans. The emergence and spread of antimicrobial resistant salmonella species has become a worldwide health challenge. In this PhD study of Dorcas, extracts of several plant species used for stomach ailments in humans and animals were tested against a wide range of foodborne pathogens. When evaluated for cytotoxicity, some extracts had good selectivity index values, meaning they were more toxic to the bacteria than to the mammalian cells, which is what we'd like. The plant Loxostylus elata was one of the most promising species, and several active compounds were isolated and identified for the first time from the leaves of this tree. Also as part of this study, the susceptibility profile of Salmonella isolates of animal origin indicated that approximately 84% of isolates tested were susceptible to a range of antibiotics, while approximately 7% were resistant to between five and seven currently used antibacterial drugs, which is concerning. Pulpsfield gel electrophoresis, or PFGE, analysis of Salmonella entritidis and Salmonella typhimurium isolates indicated there was no genetic relatedness between resistant strains. Methanol and hot water extracts of Loxostylus elata and one of the isolated compounds had very interesting efficacy against biofilm formation, as well against established preformed biofilms of a number of different species of foodborne pathogenic bacteria. The pure compound had very good anti-inflammatory effects against lipoxygenase and inducible nitric oxide or NO synthase, as well as very good antioxidant activity in various assays. The emergence and spread of antimicrobial resistant Salmonella species has become a worldwide health challenge. Animals are carriers of a number of Salmonella cerevars. And the development of multidrug antibiotic resistance among Salmonella cerevars isolated from animals in South Africa is an indication of the need to enforce strict monitoring and follow-up of resistance among bacteria isolated from animals. This will help prevent the emergence and distribution of drug-resistant salmonellosis in humans. An MSc study conducted by Rosemary highlighted the potential of South African plants as quorum sensing and biofilm inhibitors. 
Our research also focuses on gram-positive pathogenic bacteria, including Staphylococcus aureus and non-aureus Staphylococci implicated in mastitis cases in humans and dairy cattle. Some plant extracts tested had good activity against isolates from mastitis cases in cows. Several also had good results relating to inhibiting biofilms formed by these gram-positive bacteria. The extracts were not toxic to bovine derma cells at the lab at the highest concentration tested, which is a good sign if they're going to be applied topically in mastitis cases. Selected extracts also had interesting anti-inflammatory and antioxidant effects contributing to their value in future studies. Current studies in this line are focusing on quorum sensing inhibition and the best extracts are undergoing further tests relating to chemical composition using various methodologies. Formulations are being prepared for in vitro testing prior to which a pilot study will be undertaken in the coming months to determine their efficacy in reducing the bacterial load in dairy cattle. And this is funded in part by the translational medicine research theme of the faculty. And hopefully we will lead to a low cost, low technology product that may be used in the future for combating mastitis or, or at least reducing the incidence of mastitis in rural livestock keepers farms. Another project relates to antiparasitic activity of plant extracts, particularly antihelmintic or anti-nematode effic efficacy. Biological activity assays against parasitic nematodes are difficult to conduct as the organisms can't be easily cultured in the laboratory and require an animal host. The correlation between efficacy against the free living model nematode, Cenorhabditis elegans, and the parasitic nematode, Haemonchus contortus, was investigated. Some extracts had good efficacy and also strong anti inflammatory and antioxidant activity. A further PhD project of Fikiles revealed plant species with promising activity against nematodes, including plant, plant parasitic meloidogyne species, the root knot nematodes, which cause major economic losses in crops worldwide. Seasonal and geographic variation in plants for selection of high performing strains for cultivation is also an area of research. Chemical markers or active compounds also need to be identified to standardize active preparations. Research on this project, conducted by a number of different students, focuses on protecting chicken feed against contamination with Aspergillus and Fusarium species, namely aflatoxins and fumonazins. Additionally, the plant-based feed additives aim to protect poultry against infection, for example, colibacillosis, aspergillosis, salmonellosis, and campylobacteriosis, and mostly in vitro work has been done to date. Some interesting articles have been published in recent times, as early as a few days ago, regarding resurgences of campylobacter infections, which may in part be caused by the reduction in the use of antibiotics in farms as feed additives or growth promoters and then these bacteria may be transferred to human subjects. A number of studies have been conducted by students regarding the use of plants to enhance poultry production. A survey was conducted in Zimbabwe to determine which plants were most commonly used for poultry disorders. These and other plant species were selected and tested against various poultry pathogens on the basis of traditional use in literature or in the survey. The most frequently reported zoonotic disease in humans in the European Union in recent years is Campylobacteriosis, and the bacterial species most often implicated is Campylobacter jejuni. Broiler chicken meat contaminated with C. jejuni is considered to be a major source of human Campylobacteriosis. Interestingly, broiler chickens are asymptomatic Campylobacter carriers. The most important primary contamination site of Campylobacter is at the farm level because Campylobacter exists widely in the outside environment. In vitro activity of plant extracts was demonstrated against a large number of poultry pathogenic bacteria and fungi together with other beneficial properties. 
A promising plant species was selected for a feed additive pilot study currently being conducted in broiler chickens experimentally infected with Campylobacter jejuni. This study is also partly funded by the translational medicine research theme. Additional research in our group focuses on anti-inflammatory and antioxidant efficacy effects as has been previously mentioned. Now this relates to the beneficial effects of the plant extracts on the host as well as the detrimental effects on the pathogen. The impact of invasive plants is severe and therefore deserves serious attention. It's not impossible that control through utilization without encouraging propagation may be one of the options to consider. With this in mind, invasive plants may be good sources of medicinal compounds which serve as alternatives to highly exploited plants with similar medicinal properties. Many weeds have been incorporated into the traditional South African Materia Medica and are used in the treatment of several disorders. These plants may be developed into low-cost, low-technology plant-based remedies on a more commercial scale. Similarly, endophytes or microbes living inside plants are an extremely under-researched area, particularly in South Africa, and it has been found in some studies that bacteria or fungi isolated from well-known medicinal plants can produce highly active medicinal compounds such as the anti-cancer drug Taxol which is produced by the endophyte as well as by the host plant. Ethnoveterinary medicine may provide exciting leads for antimicrobial, antilmintic and other interesting bioactivities including anti-tick or acaricidal activity which I haven't touched on in this lecture. Cytotoxicity is also an important aspect to consider in tandem with bioactivity studies to determine specific antipathogenic activity and not general toxicity. Anti-inflammatory, antioxidant and immune modulatory activity are important host specific activities to consider. Plants may be useful sources of antibiotic feed additive alternatives. Ethnoveterinary medicine provides us with leads to produce active, safe, potentized plant extracts or fractions produced by selective extraction or purified compounds for further research and development into useful products. A focus on One Health is critical in the next era of human and animal medicine. There is a growing realization that conventional formal sector healthcare and husbandry interventions from the developed world cannot sustainably meet the basic stock raising and food security needs of most rural people in the developing world, where every rural community keeps animals. Ethnoveterinary medicine can potentially contribute to enhancing the overall health of animals, amongst other aspects, as part of an integrated approach to One Health. In closing, I would like to express appreciation for those who have mentored me throughout my career. The path to becoming an academic is a long one and I have been assisted greatly by several mentors. I can't mention all of them but will select a few who have been with me for many years, continuing with advice and mentorship. Prof. Hannes van Staden was my PhD supervisor and over the past 20 plus years since then, we have remained in contact and collaborated on many different projects. His personal interest, kindness and care for his students is legendary. Prof. Anna Yeager was my PhD co-supervisor and a wonderful role model. Her considered advice and warm friendship has been much appreciated over the years. Prof. Corvus Ierloff is an inspiring and courageous mentor who taught me a great deal over the years. His continuing enthusiasm for science, as well as his interest in the students and mentees, is amazing and continues. I would like to also thank the staff of the Department of Paraclinical Sciences, including the HODs over the years who have been associated with the department, Prof. Jerry Swan, Prof. Christo Boeta, and most recently Prof. Nenene Kekwana. The administrative and technical staff, Madeleine, Arena, Annette, William, and Titus are also gratefully thanked. Special thanks go to Tarine de Vinar, Dr. Francine Boerta. Words are not enough to express my gratitude and thanks for all your contributions and support. Colleagues from the Dean's Office, namely Prof. Vinnie Naidu, Prof. Marinda Oersthuizen, Francie and Chris are also thanked. I would also like to acknowledge all the funders, 
sponsors and collaborators, too many to mention, without whom effective, meaningful research is not possible. I want to thank all my family and friends who have supported and encouraged me. There are again too many to name and I am eternally grateful to you all. Not all are still here in person, but they live on. Importantly, I would like to thank all the postgraduate students who have generated such a wonderful culture of working together and succeeding, regardless of the many differences between us all in the group. Without you, there would be no research being done, no exciting findings to report on, and no bright future in research to look forward to, despite the challenges. It's truly a family away from home for all of us. Together with the students, the personnel from student administration are most gratefully thanked for their outstanding support and contributions. Leonie Johnson, Cassis Ngomizulu, and Henriette van der Vaart are thanked. And finally, I'd like to thank you very much for your attention. Dear colleagues, we have come to the end of tonight's proceedings. I'm sure that many of you would have liked the, the opportunity to pose a few questions to Professor McGaw. While today's function did not allow for live questions, I'm sure Professor McGaw will be more than amenable to respond to them if the questions are sent directly to her. Before we close, I would like to once again congratulate Professor McGaw on being promoted to full professorship. As we just heard in her inaugural address, she has a tremendously interesting journey of discovery ahead of her as she advances the field of ethno-veterinary medicine. With the major role she's already played in the field, I have no doubt we will see great strides in the field and I look forward to seeing her move higher in the NRF rankings towards becoming an A-rated scientist. With that, colleagues, I wish you a very good night and goodbye. Thank you. <laughs>